uh, as redigging the wells of divine healing. And uh, how many of you are drinking clearer water out of your well right now because of the word that we've shared? Uh, how many of you would say that you've had a fresh revelation in this area? Anybody? All right, number of us. Uh, how many of you have actually, over the last few weeks, actually received healing in your body as a result of, uh, you know, the word that we've ministered or prayer that we have uh, had? Uh, and of course, prayer happens <laughs> on a Sunday, uh, people praying during the week in our small groups and in different times. And so, you know, things uh, don't always have to happen here. Things can happen wherever you are. And uh, how many of you are still standing for your healing right now? You know that healing belongs to you, but it hasn't fully manifested, but you're still standing for healing. Well, praise God for that. Uh, you see, in the end, we don't give up. And uh, I was just rereading re again that whole area. I touched on it last week. Uh, around redigging the wells. And, uh, you know, in Genesis chapter 26, it tells us that uh, Isaac uh, began to prosper, and the wells that his father Abraham had dug uh, really yielded well for him. And uh, in the end, the Philistines envied Isaac, so they came in and filled in the wells with, 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 with earth, as it were, with soil, and he had to redig the wells all over again. And an interesting comment there that, uh, that it says that they went, moved to another place and dug a well there, and uh, the water began to flow, and the Bible says some herdsmen came in uh, from one of the neighboring tribes, and they quarreled with them. And you know, sometimes I'm mindful that when people reach out for healing and, and they're getting ready for that healing water to flow, as it were, the devil comes in and quarrels with them and tries to tell them that it's not true, or it's true for everybody else, but not true for them. And friends, in the end, all of us have to dig our own well of revelation. We have to dig our own well of salvation. We have to dig our own well for healing. We have to dig our own well in the area of tithes and offerings and of prosperity. You know, we can be inspired by somebody else's well, uh, and we can drink from it to a certain extent, but in the end, all of us have to dig our own well. And... Um, the whole area of uh, revelation uh, is really descriptive of uh, when we dig a well and suddenly we strike water. Uh, and friends, once we have the revelation, the devil can't talk us out of it. Once we have a revelation, it belongs to us. And so with that, I want to do a quick recap on where we've been so far. Um, and uh, today, uh, God willing, this may be the last message on this particular subject. Uh, this coming week, I want to get into other things. Uh, I've got a couple of things stirring in my spirit, and somewhere during the week I'm going to make a snap decision, and then I'll know exactly what to do. Um, <laughs> let me tell you that we don't operate randomly, but we're just following the leading of the Lord, and then when God places something in our heart, that's what we want to put the focus on. So, um, as I said, we are studying the scriptures around the area of divine healing and uh, really trusting God that there is a fresh uh, faith uh, fresh revelation in these areas that we can reach out and walk in our full covenant rights because healing is part of our covenant right. Jesus purchased it for us on the cross of Calvary. We said that in Exodus 15 verse 26 that God revealed himself as the Lord Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. And we said that divine healing uh, belongs to us today, and we can be healed from all sicknesses and all diseases and from all pains uh, and from the results of any injury that we may have had because of Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross of Calvary. We talk about Christ's redemptive work on the cross. Last week, I made three uh, main points, uh, and very quickly, uh, we talked about the serpent that uh, God told Moses to make and lift it up on a pole. And we said that serpent represented Jesus Christ and him crucified on the cross. We said that salvation for our soul and healing for our uh, body in terms of God's mind, it's easy. Um, Jesus says, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or rise up and be healed, and rise up and walk. He says, which is easier? Uh, and sometimes, you know, it can be difficult in our own mind, but when we have a revelation, it's easy. We lay a hold of it by revelation. And we said that if we need healing from sickness and disease, uh, we need to look at Jesus Christ, our healer, and at his finished work on the cross, because Jesus says it is finished. Nothing else has to be added to it. Uh, and uh, so with that, 
I want to speak to you this morning about three miracles in the ministry of Jesus Christ, uh, three consecutive miracles. Um, and I want to pick up, uh, first of all, from Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, and uh, read um, uh, a story here in the life and in the ministry of Jesus Christ, starting here with verse 21. It says, When Jesus has crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the ru rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and uh, he says, when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and he begged him earnestly, saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Let's just pray and trust God to speak to us again through the teaching and preaching of the Word. Father, we once again commit this time to you. We thank you, Lord God, that you're present uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, that you're giving wisdom and revelation to each and every one of us. You're opening the eyes of our understanding and helping us, Lord, to uh, receive a fresh revelation in this holy area and, Lord, in any other area where we need revelation. And we declare once again that your word is living, it's powerful, it is sharper than a two-edged sword. And so, Father, uh, open us, open the eyes of our understanding and show us the things that we need to see. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we have a story uh, of a ruler of the synagogue, uh, Jairus uh, was his name. He came to Jesus and he began to petition Jesus for him to come to his house because his daughter was lying at the point of death. Now this story is repeated in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. Uh, in one of the Gospels we are told that the girl was about 12 years old. Um, and so Jesus says, I will come. So as he turned around and they walked away, uh, Jesus was interrupted um, uh, by a woman that pressed about him, a woman with an issue of blood. And I want to speak to, to, to you about her later on. Uh, and so we're going to take that gap out and we come back to it. I want to carry on reading here in verse 35. It says, as Jesus was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a turmoil and those who wept and wailed loudly. And when he came in, he said to them, Why do you make this commotion and weep? For the child is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. And when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumai, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. <laughs> all right, well, praise God. A wonderful miracle. Uh, do we have all the lights on in the house here today? Can we just make sure that we've got all the lights on? Uh, I really want to be able to see everybody that I'm speaking to this morning. That's better. And uh, praise God. So what a marvelous story here. And yet in the life of Jesus, it's just another day. It's just another miracle. This is like constantly taking place. Um, Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue. And, uh, you know, people from this, uh, the leaders of the synagogue and certainly the leaders in the temple were not pro-Jesus. Uh, they didn't like him. Uh, he, he, by what he did, it threatened them. It threatened their own inadequacy. It threatened their position. Um, and, it, and, and it showed him up that they were not people of revelation. They were only people of rules and regulation, but no revelation and no relationship. Um, yet this man here had a need in his life. And it's an interesting thing, but sometimes people are kind of anti-God or indifferent to God, but when they have a need in their life, they certainly know where to turn to him. Praise God for that. You know, like we don't want to in any way belittle that, you know. At least people come and... Uh, and uh, 
Sometimes, you know, many of us have not come to God for the right reasons, but God accepts us anyway. Aren't you glad that God is a gracious God? And so here is Jairus. He comes to Jesus, and when he sees Jesus, he falls down before him, worships him, and he says, he says, Teacher, Master, please come to my house. My little girl is lying at the point of death. And Jesus says, I will come. So they head in the way, and as I mentioned earlier on, they got this interruption going on where this woman with the issue of blood pressed in. And, uh, and this is the second miracle I want to talk to you about, and I'll come back to you, uh, uh, to you about that very shortly. But while Jesus finished speaking to her, uh, he turned around, and, and, and next minute uh, uh, you get this uh, report coming through from Jairus' house to say, Jairus, it's too late. It's too late. The girl is now not only sick, but well, she's actually now died. Don't trouble the master anymore. You know, it's an amazing thing, but sometimes uh, <laughs> we have situations going on, and you know, the reality is, friends, uh, we know that God is a good God, and we know that all things are possible, and we know that all things are available to us, but on the ground, sometimes we are challenged. We've got stuff going on, and sometimes when we pray, sometimes things get worse before they get better. And the key in this situation, my friend, is that we do not give up and we don't suddenly accept this new report as final authority. You know, Isaiah chapter 52 says, whose report do you believe? And in the end, friend, the report of the Lord is what we hold on to, whether situations and circumstances and symptoms fluctuate going up and down, we believe the report of the Lord. And so, the report comes, Jairus is informed, saying that his little girl is now dead. Don't trouble the master anymore. And Jesus heard those words. And the Bible says, as soon as Jesus heard the words, he turned around and he, and he addressed Jairus, and he said to Jairus, do not be afraid, only believe. Do not be afraid. Now, we're all aware that Jesus is not just speaking randomly. Jesus is not just saying words so he can fill the Bible with many words, which are kind of, you know, like, I mean, Jesus is speaking truth to the man right now that is of utmost importance. Because the man reached out to Jesus for healing, and now they're saying it's too late. And uh, Jesus says, do not be afraid. You know, when we reach out to God for <laughs> healing or for provision or for this or for that, and suddenly we get hit with a report that things are now worse than what they were before, fear wants to come in and grip our heart. It's been said that fear and faith don't work in the same heart at the same time. All right? And if we want faith to work in our heart, we need to keep that fear out. <laughs> I... Uh, I remember during the height of our refurbishment, uh, when we refurbished the building uh, back in um, 2006, 2007, 2008, we did a major extension in our upstairs uh, administration area, and, uh, and you know, at that stage, and then we moved downstairs, we ripped out all the toilets. How do you remember the days of the porter loose outside? Uh, some of you would remember that. We had no toilets in the building because everything was being refurbished, um, and uh, put some toilets outside and, uh, and uh, carried on with the work. And in the end, you know, we carried on and we lifted off the roof and built uh, the offices and, and what have you. And uh, in those days, we had some money laid aside for that refurbishment. And we really felt that God wanted us to proceed and to just move forward. Uh, and regardless of uh, uh, the, the, whether the money was going to stretch far enough, and the plan was that if we run out of money, um, we're in a very good position financially, and we'll just go to the bank, and the bank will help us a little bit and loan us a bit of money, and we can carry on. Uh, and uh, now, loaning is not always our first uh, choice, and it's not always our preferred choice, but sometimes, you know, you just, in order to move ahead, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Um, there's only one, one slight uh, uh, glitch with that whole deal, that there was a financial crisis that was on, was that 2008, and banks prior to that were just loaning up money freely everywhere. I want more money, more money. You know, they're almost giving away credit cards, mo money and everything, and the financial cr crunch comes on, and what do banks do? They tighten up, and they don't release money very easily. Well, 
uh, at this stage, we got seven or eight builders working on the job all day, every day. And uh, so you can imagine the bill that comes in every week, you know, there's just a whole lot of money that gets spent very quickly. You've got tradespeople, you've got plumbers, you've got electricians, you've got people. And now, we did as much as what we could on a voluntary basis, but certain things we had to, uh, as it were, you know, get done on a commercial basis, and suddenly there is no money, and the bank don't give us no money. Uh, I can assure you that uh, I would like to be able to say, the, 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 my attitude was, no problem, God's going to fix it, but I'm telling you, fear gripped my heart. And I wrestled with that jolly fear for a few nights, and I mean in the nighttime when everything gets quiet, you know, in the, in the daytime you can keep yourself busy, but in, in the nighttime when everything goes quiet, and now I don't even know what to pray for anymore because I've already prayed, all I know is how to, to do is to groan, and I'm kind of groaning, and I wasn't sure if I was groaning in the spirit or groaning in the flesh, and I'm sort of lying there, oh, and I'm tossing and turning, and Vanessa says, what's the matter? I says, oh, it's just, oh I'm just, you know, I'm just churning. She says, come on, she says, God will supply, go to sleep. You know, the faith girl, go to sleep. And uh, anyway, I'm pleased to say that, uh, that we did come through in the end, and, uh, you know, God looked after us, and once again, the faithfulness of God's people in the area of, uh, you know, just faithfully tithing and offering, and, you know, we, we came through in the end, but I was having sort of, uh, the devil was coming in to try to quarrel with me, and he was trying to give me visions that we was going to lose everything, and, uh, and we already had a loan with the bank, and uh, like, oh gosh, you know, when things, uh, the pressure comes on. So all, I'm saying all of that to say this, that fear wants to come in and grip your heart, and at that stage, we need to fight fear, and we need to hold on to faith. That's why Jesus turned around and he said, said to Jairus, Jairus, do not be afraid. Only believe. In other words, don't let faith get into your heart, uh, fear get into your heart right now. Hold on to your faith. Only believe. Well, Jairus was a man of faith. He already had faith in his heart. But now the devil tried to replace faith with fear because of the terrible report that came in. And so... When Jairus initially came to Jesus, the Bible says that he petitioned Jesus and he said, Master, please come to my house, for my little girl is lying at the point of death, and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she shall live. So he made a strong faith confession. Let us know that Jairus was a man of faith. But you see, even people of faith can be subject to fear or to an attack of fear coming in when suddenly, you know, things look like everything turns to custards and suddenly things were already bad before and now it's even worse. Um, and the trick at that moment is to not let fear creep in uh, because then things will not only remain worse, but things could get worse still. Uh, so he says to the man, he says, Jairus, he says, do not be afraid only believe. And in other words, uh, hold fast to your initial confession of faith. H how do we not be afraid? And how do we only believe? We keep on saying what we have said before. When Jairus came and he said to Jesus, he says, lay your hands on her that she could be healed and she shall live. That was a faith confession. And when the report of the girl having died came in, Jesus was more or less saying, look, Jairus, hold on to what you said back here. Just don't change your confession now. All right? And, you know, at that point, the devil comes in sideways and he begins to quarrel with us and say, ah, too late now. You're going to lose it all. You know, God comes through for other people, but he will not come through for you. And he'll begin to uh, try to uh, malign, as it were, God's character. But the Bible tells us that God is a faithful God. And the Bible also says that with man, certain things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And that's basically what Jesus is writing on here. It says, Jairus, do not be afraid. There's still hope. We can fix this situation. But what I need you to do is I need you to believe. And so, uh, as we have read earlier on, um, uh, they came to Jairus' house, and there was a whole lot of commotion going on. And, you know, we are told that uh, in Jewish society, back then they had uh, professional wailers that would come in, professional mourners that would wail and cry and make a real commotion. 
And of course, Jesus comes in, and these are just, uh, of course, family would have been sad, but there were these professional people that were already there because they, they wanted to get some money, so they're wailing with the family, and they're crying and everything, and Jesus, Jesus just put them all outside. Just, you all get out of here. And uh, what Jesus endeavored to do is to remove all doubt and all unbelief. And friend, when you're in a battle, you've got to be careful who you listen to and who you associate with. Because uh, the devil will use them to talk you out of it. When you're standing your ground, you know you've heard from God. You know that you've got a scripture that you're standing on. And you know that this is right and that this, this is true and that this is for you. Then don't let the devil uh, send the wrong people along to rob uh, faith from you. So Jesus put them all outside. Just oh, you all get out of here. And he said to them, why do you cry and why do you wail? He says, the girl is not dead but only sleeping. Well, Jesus... Uh, knew that the girl was dead, and he wasn't in any way trying to make up funny stories or anything, but he simply stated, he says, the girl is sleeping, we're going to go and wake her up. And, uh, and Jesus is already speaking faith as well. So he tells Jairus, hold on to your original confession of faith. Then he goes in, puts out all doubt, all unbelief, and, you know, sometimes... <laughs> It's not so easy to get rid of people around you that are filled with doubt and unbelief because sometimes it means we'd have to get rid of family members and we can't do that. It just means we close off towards certain things that are being said. And in the end, friend, in the end, it's keeping out all doubt and unbelief from your mind and from your heart. It's not letting the thoughts and the devil bombard you with, you know, those fiery darts that Ephesians chapter 6 speaks about, you know, that we can, we're able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy with the shield of faith and keep our hearts strong and keep reading the word because if a, an evil report comes, we go back to God's report and we keep on reading the verse of Scripture that we're standing on. So this is the verse of Scripture that I'm standing on and because Jesus had already affirmed to Jairus, he said to him, look, he says, Jairus, don't be afraid. Only believe. And uh, they put everybody outside. Jesus goes inside to where the girl was lying on some... Uh, on some bed, I suppose. Uh, he took Peter, James, and John with him. Um, sometimes, you know, Bible scholars refer to Peter, James, and John as Jesus' inner circle. You know, Jesus had 12 people. Then he, further out, he had another 70. And then, you know, the crowds out beyond that. But the people most closest to Jesus was Peter, James, and John. And when the chips were down and Jesus needed faith and he needed somebody with him that he could utterly, you know, uh, rely on and trust in. He took those three guys with him. He took the parents of the child uh, with him, walked into that room, and then walked up to the girl and said to her, I say to you, little girl, arise. And the Bible says she immediately arose and, uh, w and walked. She was 12 years old, and they were all overcome with great amazement. I want to look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Um, because you and I can learn from this situation here in the life and in the ministry of Jesus, and for that matter, with Jairus and with his family, where things were bad, and then he asked for prayer, and then things got worse. But the outcome was nonetheless stunning. You know, one minute the, the, the girl needs healing. The next minute she needs to be raised from the dead. Uh, yet God is still able to come through when he sees faith in the lives of people. So Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14. As much then as we have a great high priest who is already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith in him. Let us hold fast our confession. You see, the Hebrew um, Christians had confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord, as their Savior, as the Messiah, as the promised one that was going to come, but they came under intense pressure and under intense persecution. And, uh, you know, not just from without, but from within. Uh, other uh, um, you know, Jewish people that did not have the revelation began to give him a hard time. And here's the writer in the book of he uh, Hebrews saying to these guys, come on now, guys. Now, things might be tough right now, but hold fast to the confession of your faith 
in Jesus Christ. Now, in a general sense, but the same thing is true, friend, when we're dealing with any specific issue in our life, where we're reaching out to God for a miracle in this department, or a breakthrough in that area, or a provision over here, or a healing over there. Once we release our faith, and once we make our faith declaration based on the Word of God, God says, hold fast to the confession of your faith. Don't deviate from it. Don't back down. Uh, don't let the devil quarrel with you um, because you will strike water. You will get to what you believe in God for if you hold fast to the confession of your faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says more or less the same thing. He says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Have you know that here's a perfect opportunity in the life of Jairus to waver just a little bit. You know, his, his girl is, is already lying at the point of death. Uh, he asks for healing, and then the report comes, uh, oh, she's now dead, it's too late. Have you know that here's an opportunity right there to wave a little bit, like, oh, gosh, you know, what shall I do now? Let's just all go home and, 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 and so forth. But uh, no, the Bible says here, it says, hold fast to the profession of your faith, without wavering, for he is faithful who promised. He is faithful who promised. Now, we don't do random stuff. We don't do crazy things. Uh, uh, as in, you know, sometimes people uh, say, okay, I'm just going to pray, and I'm just going to pray that I'm going to be a millionaire. Um, and I'll be a millionaire and say, for argument's sake, in three months' time. You know, here's a person that might be struggling to pay the rent and put petrol into their car, and suddenly they want to become a, uh, you know, a millionaire in three months' time. How do you know that it's just unlikely going to happen? So, and then to say, well, no, I'm just going to hold fast to the confession of my faith. I'm, you know, it's only three days away. I'm going to be a millionaire in three days. Well, <laughs> how do you know that you're most likely going to be disappointed? So don't do crazy things. Don't do wild things. You know, stay with the Word of God and, and stay with common sense and, and, and let other brothers and sisters around you journey with you, people of faith who, who, who know what you have got faith for and, and so forth and just don't do crazy things. As I say, you know, this whole faith message that uh, Pastor Vanessa and I were brought up in uh, uh, way back when we got born again and we came into this teaching and everything, there were some wild things done. There were some crazy things done. I mean, people did stupid and crazy things. And guess what? The message got a bad name. But you know how you know that there's nothing wrong with the message? The word is true regardless. All right. But there's always somebody that's crazy and does something crazy and, and, and so forth. And then for some reason, you know, the, the message gets uh, distorted. And, uh, you know, uh, I just always remember that uh, with a lot of the fine teaching that uh, Pastor Vanessa and I have received from Kenneth Hagen. Uh, and the man's been maligned, and the man's been criticized, but, you know, he done nothing wrong. It's just the second and third and fourth generation people thereafter, so-called, uh, you know, called themselves faith people, but they were not faith people. They were crazy people. And, uh, <laughs> you know, Kenneth Hagin was a good man, and the message that he taught was a good, solid message. It worked in his own life, and it worked in the lives of many people that he's taught. And, uh, and, and, uh, but as I say, you know, there will always be somebody that's crazy and do something weird and wonderful or stupid. Uh, and so forth. But friend, you and I, we got our feet on the ground, and uh, we are solid, uh, and we do things solidly. Now, let me move on to the second miracle. We just looked at Jairus and at the raising of his daughters uh, uh, from the dead. I want to now look at the woman that got healed uh, from her uh, from her illness, from her disease. She had an issue of blood. We might say some sort of a, a woman a, a, a problem there. And here in Mark chapter 5, verse 25, uh, remember that Jairus came, spoke to Jesus, um, come to my house. Jesus says, I will come. They turned away, and the Bible says, and the crowds were thronging them. Well, we're picking this uh, story up in verse 25. It says, now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, and it suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. Underline there, rather grew worse. All right, here we got a deteriorating situation going on. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. 
And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. (laughs) Done what? Well, she touched him. (laughs) All right. Uh, And he looked, uh, verse 33, And the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. All right. Miracle number two. This woman quite obviously had a severe um, condition going on in her body. Uh, This has happened uh, for the last 12 years. She sought out the medical professionals, but they couldn't help her. She had spent all the money that she had, and now she's no better, but actually things are getting worse. Um, Presumably, Uh, With that condition, she would have not only lost general health, but also lost strength. She lost her money. She lost her strength. She is at the end of what she's able to do. And the Bible says she heard about Jesus. Um, You know, sometimes we look at other people and say, gosh, you know, like I'm really inspired by the faith of these people. Where do they get their, their faith from? The Bible says faith comes by hearing. All right. This is one of the reasons why we teach the Word, because faith comes by hearing the Word. Faith doesn't come by hearing about, you know, fancy things and, you know, current affairs and, you know, little entertainment stories. Faith comes by hearing the Word. That's why we preach the Word, so that faith can come. And so this woman has a a major situation going on in her life. Next minute, she hears about Jesus. Um, And uh, evidently, She had heard that people are coming close to Jesus. Now, Jesus himself is laying hands on some people, but other people are laying hands on him. They're not waiting for him to lay hands on them. They're saying, we're going to lay hands on him. And uh, so much so that people pressed about him uh, to touch the hem of his garment. Uh, Now, Jesus would have worn one of those long robes, I suppose, uh, and down the edge of his garment, uh, and people pressed about him to touch his, ca- his garment. The Bible says, as many as touched, they were healed. When people touched Jesus or his garment, there was a release of the power of God. It flowed into their body. It literally flowed into their body, and they got healed. And friends, healing is not some mystical Oh, we don't know how it happens. Well, we know how it happens. We lay hold of the power of God. We create a point of contact, and that faith touch, that faith touch causes that power to flow. It drives out sickness and disease, and it brings forth healing and restoration in the lives of people, and that's exactly what happened. We read a couple of chapters earlier on that uh, people were absolutely thronging Jesus And as many as touched, they were healed. They were out in the marketplace. When people heard that Jesus was coming into town, they gathered all the sick people together from the whole region, laid them out in the marketplace, and Jesus would walk through the marketplace because Jesus was typically where people were. So he went out there, and as he walked through there, as he walked past them, people touched, and as many as touched were healed. And the woman heard about that. So what she said to herself In verse 28, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now, how did the woman get faith? Well, the Bible says she heard about Jesus. She heard the report. That's how faith rolls in her heart. And as I say, it's no mystery how faith comes. We know that faith comes by hearing. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 tells us exactly that. Faith comes by hearing. Now, in this instance, though, Uh, the woman had possibly heard that Jesus was going around and he prayed for some people by laying hands on them. This is the story that uh, Jairus had heard. So Jairus says, please come and lay your hands on my daughter that she may be healed and she shall live. 
But the woman said, I'm not waiting for Jesus to lay hands on, on me. He may, he may not. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch Jesus. And, you know, sometimes people are passive with their faith and say, well, you know, God knows what I need, you know, in his good time. Well, Frank, God's good time was 2,000 years ago when healing was paid for on the cross. And by his stripes we have been healed. That's God's good time. From here on, it's just a matter of us receiving. And we have to establish our own point of contact. We have to establish that faith touch. Jairus asked for it. And as it was, he needed a bit more by the time they got you know, to his house. They needed, you know, the girl to be raised from the dead. But he asked for the faith touch. But the woman said, I'm not waiting. And sometimes we need to get a bit more aggressive with our faith and not hang back. Because God is not the one that holds out on us. And sometimes people think, well, you know, God knows. And, you know, in his good time. No, no, no. We've already established a couple of weeks ago that now, now is the time of salvation. Now, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time to receive. So she established her own point of contact, and she says, I'm going to just press in. Now, it's a little side issue. What's going on here? The woman has got a flow of blood. Ceremonially, she's unclean. You know, according to old Jewish uh, you know, law, the law of Moses, she wasn't meant to be amongst crowds. And that's why she was terrified when she came close to Jesus because she was just going to, as it were, sneak in, grab her healing, and take off again. Uh, and, uh, and when Jesus says, who touched me? His disciples says, Master, <laughs> you're saying the threat. You, you know, the, the, the crowds are thronging and you, you, and, and you say, who touched me? But everybody's touching you. No, 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 but here's a difference. People were bumping into Jesus here and there, but there was one person in this particular instance that touched Jesus with faith in their heart. And other people touched Jesus and nothing happened because they, they weren't there to, as it were, they were just here to observe. They might have been curious. But this woman touched Jesus with faith in her heart. And the moment she touched him, it caused the power of God to flow. The Bible says that Jesus perceived the power of had flown out of him. They had already been bumping into people all the way along. Bump, bump, you know, there's all this commotion going on. And over here, the woman touches him, and Jesus says, who touched me? So, you know, uh, there's something going on here that, friends, that we can pick up on where we just press in. The woman with the issue of blood, she pressed in. She wasn't going to let culture keep her away because culture told her you can't be amongst crowds. You're unclean. You're now not acceptable. We have to press past all of that. Tradition, press past all of that. And say, well, well other people got prayed for and they didn't get here. Well, we press past all of that. I mentioned last week that, you know, the devil sometimes contaminates people's wells by somebody's experience and says, see, there you go. Not everybody gets healed. Well, everybody that touches Jesus by faith gets healed. All right. We've got we to gotta almost like be really, really blunt about these things. Because we can't let other people's negative experience contaminate our own well of revelation. I remember um, Vanessa and I were in the U.S. Uh, many years ago on one of the trips over there, typically get to a conference or to something. And uh, we got to a church there, and R.W. Schumbach was preaching. Uh, of course, he's gone to heaven many years ago. But he is a man. They called him the preaching machine. He's just an amazing guy with an ability to teach and more preach. He'd do more preaching than, than teaching. And afterwards, he'd pray for people. And uh, just had a marvelous anointing on his life to, to get people healed and, uh, and so forth. And uh, so they said to him, Brother Schumbach, um, you know, when you walk down the line and, uh, you know, you pray for people and, uh, or sometimes what they used to do in those days, rather than the, the minister walk down, they filed the people past him um, and, and he lay hands on them and they move on and he, he'd be stationary. Um, and they said to him, what would you do if you prayed for somebody and they'll die on the spot? He would say, next please. That's what he said. Next please. So, you know, I don't think he was in any way trying to be callous. He wasn't in any way trying to be rude. But friend, when it comes to faith, we've got to be sometimes quite 
aggressive and say, well, look, you know, they told us they were believing God, but they still died. We don't really know everything that's gone on in the life of that person. We can only be responsible for our own well. All right? Is everybody okay with that? No, no, I'm not sort of uh, I'm trampling around a little bit. I'm, I'm liable to trample on people's toes. But in the end, friend, when the chips are down, we've got to dig our own well, and we've got to protect our own well, and not let other people's experience become our theology, because the theology is in the Word. That's why I said that I said a couple of weeks ago. People say, I really believe in healing because I've seen somebody healed. And I say, well, it, it would be better to say, I really believe in healing because I see it in the Word. All right? I see it in the Word. And, we, and, and the idea is that we, we endeavor to bring our experiences up to the level of the Word rather than to bring the Word down to the level of people's negative experiences. Because if we do that, friend, when everything starts, it, you know, it's, it's called relativism, then people say, well, it's all relative to what's going on at the time. No, friend, the Word is always true. All right? The Word is always true. So I got a little bit sidetracked here by talking about the woman with the issue of blood. And she established her own point of contact. She pressed past the crowds. She pressed past the traditional understanding and the cultural understanding, the ceremonial understanding even, and she came in and she pressed through. Now, by now, uh, the woman would have experienced severe weakness in her body. Remember, she's losing like blood all the time. Um, and, uh, but she says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to press through. I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. And what exactly is the wording here? She says, and I shall be made well. That's a faith confession. That is a confession of faith. If she had said, I'm going to touch the hem of his garment and I hope I get healed, that's a hope confession. But friend, in order for us to receive healing, it's good to have hope for healing, but in the end we need to have faith for healing rather than put hope out there and always put hope uh, because hope is always future, but faith is always for now. And so she established her own point of contact. She made her faith confession. She pressed through. And the Bible says immediately she felt the power flowed out of him and dried up the flow of her. And she knew she was healed, like right there. And as she's trying to duck away, because remember, she's not supposed to be there. She's trying to duck away. And uh, we don't know if she went down on all hand, you know, hands and feet to crawl towards Jesus. or uh, We don't know how she got near him, but she touched him. And as she's trying to tuck away, uh, to, to, as it were, to pull away, Jesus says, who touched me? Because the Bible says that Jesus perceived the power had flown out of him. You know, that power is uh, it's sometimes unusual. Um, you know, different ones of us that are used to praying for people, you... Sometimes, not always, but sometimes you feel that power. You feel the release of the power, and it flows, and it is almost like electricity that wants to flow, you know, and it's directional. It flows, and, and, and when it's received, you, you know it's received, and you know that healing is established. Now, there may be no immediate, you know, uh, change in the symptoms or in the circumstances, but you know that that healing has flown. But sometimes the power flows out and sometimes it bounces back again. And that lets me know that the person that we're praying for has not learned how to receive and hold on to the power. Now, I've got a friend. Uh, he's an evangelist and, gosh, phenomenal signs and wonders in his ministry. And he operates to uh, 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 quite an extent in the gifts of the Spirit. And people get healed, and there's, you know, there's such a major manifestation, and that's his anointing. Now, my anointing is not the same as his. My anointing is to teach the Word. And if you let me, I can teach the Word and get you so close to it that you almost fall into it, that all you need to do is, is that we're jumping. It's just a different anointing. People say, well, you should all do, be doing the same thing. No, we all need to flow with the anointing that God's given us. That's what I said, I shared, uh, was it a couple of weeks ago, about our experience up in, uh, in, uh, in, in Asia and getting people baptized with the Holy Spirit and everything else. They, they had already had some, uh, you know, they'd been in an environment uh, in one particular uh, situation where they were, 
you know, knew about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were trying, but they just didn't know how to receive. And, and I, I was able, by just sharing the word, it's just sharing the word, get him so close to help them to drop into it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and if you let me, um, in, in whatever we teach, I can get you real close. And this is not about bragging. It's just, I'm just, I've learned over the years what my anointing is and, and, and how it flows and, and, and what my, my gifting is. And this is one area that if you let me, I can get you real close. So you can, as it were, step into it or fall into it, uh, as it were. But you've got to pay attention. As I say, with, 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 with my friend and his ministry, you get into his meetings and people are like, you know, they're just stumped because there's stuff going on and it's real easy to pay attention because there's almost an aspect of entertainment to it. When I teach the word, it's not entertainment. You need to focus. All right? And that's why, you know, people say, oh, you know, there was a commotion down the back and, uh, uh, last week and did, did you get distracted or there was noise next door? No, 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 I don't get distracted. Uh, when, when I'm in the zone, I'm, I, you, you can put me in, in the middle of a war zone and, and I don't notice what... I mean, I notice it, but it doesn't affect me hardly, but it could affect you. And if people fluff around and there's, you know, kids playing and, and noise going on... And, it could be the very word that you need to hear. You miss that. It means that your well is not fully dark and your revelation is not fully formed. It can hinder you from, you know, from receiving. Everybody right this morning? So Jesus had the power to get the woman healed. And when she got healed, he says to her daughter, your faith has made you whole. When the gifts are in operation, the gift have, there, there is a kind of a, a different type of faith going on. But this woman wasn't waiting for the gifts to manifest. She just laid a hold of the power by faith. And Jesus affirmed that it wasn't his faith that got her healed. It was her own faith that got her healed. I remember I had a discussion specifically uh, around this whole area because I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to, how does this thing work? And, and how can we do this better? How can we, you know, uh, move people into healing more quickly and more surely and, uh, and, and help them to retain their healing rather than lose their healing? And uh, I remember I had a discussion with uh, evangelist Weston Carrier. How do you remember uh, evangelist Weston Carrier? He used to come uh, to our church every year and marvelous meetings, just a wonderful man of God. And anyway, he went to heaven some years ago. Uh, anyway, I said to him one day, I says, uh, Brother Weston, I says, when you pray for people and people get healed, I says, it seems to me, it seems to me that many, peop many people get healed on your faith rather than on their own faith. <laughs> and he he wasn't prepared to answer me there and then. Uh, he was like, uh, you know, the most humblest of men that you'd ever meet. And it almost seemed to me that if he acknowledged that, it was almost like he might have been uh, thinking of himself as bragging, so he didn't want to say anything. But I was convinced that there were people in the meetings that got healed when they received faith as he taught the Word of God or as he shared the testimonies. But some people didn't get healed on their own faith. They got healed on his faith. And they got healed when the gifts were in operation. And we say this before, we absolutely believe in the gifts. But if we need something going, you know, we need, we need a breakthrough right now and the gifts aren't in manifestation, we need to learn how to move by faith. Kenneth Hagin spoke around this extensively. He says, look, it says, we get into some meetings, he says, and the gifts are flowing and the presence of God is so strong and, and let's make the most of it. But sometimes, and this man is a prophet, that operated in the gifts of healings uh, extensively in the word of knowledge and word of wisdom and so forth. But he says, sometimes it's just not flowing. And then we just teach the word and, and pray for people by faith. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we're now not relying on the gifts. We are simply laying a hold of the power of God by sheer and raw faith. And that's what this woman has done. It was her faith that got her healed. 
She reached out. She says, if I only might just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be healed. And in fact, in the Greek language, the way that this is written, it indicates that she kept on saying, wherever she was, all the way from where she was to get close to Jesus, she kept on saying, I will touch the hem of his garment and I shall be healed. And that was her faith confession. And then she just carried it out and she laid a hold of the power of God. Jesus had the power to get her healed and she had the faith to receive the power. All right. And as I indicated on previous sessions, it's like it's getting close to Jesus is absolutely the key. Number three, a third miracle. Jesus healed two blind men. All, in, <laughs> all consecutively. In fact, if we had time, there's more miracles after that and there are more, more miracles uh, earlier on. As I said, this is just another day in the life and ministry of Jesus. But I felt that we could learn something from those three examples like right there and pick up some of the keys that we can in order to help us to receive and to lay a hold and, uh, and then to not lose it uh, again. Um, Matthew chapter 9, verse 27 when Jesus departed from there, um, where was that? Well, just uh, having, uh, having uh, left uh, Jairus' house. Remember the sequence is that Jairus asked Jesus for, to come to his house. Uh, and he says, I will come. Then the woman with the issue of blood comes in. And then they carry on to Jairus' house. And when Jesus left there, it's all the same story. He left there. Two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. Now, the indication here is that these two guys called out to Jesus and they said, Son of David, Son of David. Now, Son of David, you know, Jesus was known by many titles. They knew him, obviously, as, you know, they knew him as teacher, as rabbi, as master. They knew him as Lord. Um, and... Uh, then, you know, he, he, they, some referred to him as Messiah. Um, and they called him son of David, which was another description. Now, that meant that uh, he was from the lineage of David. But specifically, the term son of David was going to be applied to the Messiah. So when these guys said, son of David, what they were really saying is, and that's what I'm saying, you know, the Bible is a Jewish book. We need to understand the background here. What they were saying is, you're the Messiah. Have mercy on us. Remember when a couple of weeks ago we spoke about messianic healings. Isaiah chapter 60 and in fact in uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 18, 19 and 20. Jesus came and he says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And amongst that lot there, that scripture there, it says that he was going to open the eyes of the blind. And here's these two blind guys. It says here's the Messiah. He's the one that's going to come and open blind eyes. And so how did these guys receive faith? They heard it. They heard. They heard teaching around the Messiah. They heard teaching around those messianic healings that were going to take place when the Messiah arrives. And so when they saw, well, they didn't see him. They were blind. But when they heard of him and they knew that he was in town, they followed him and they said, Son of David, Son of David, have mercy on us. I made a real blunder. Some of you are laughing now. I made a real blunder many years ago, and it happens occasionally, and these things are sent to keep me humble, you know. Like I was uh, really getting into the preacher, this whole thing, and uh, in, uh, in another instance there again, a couple of blind guys, and Jesus walked right past them, and I said that one guy turned to the other and said, did you see that? He just walked right past us. Well, no, they didn't see. They were both <laughs> blind. And so anyway, so they're calling out to Jesus, but the indication here is he just carried on, and he went into the house. And that house that he was staying in, the Bible says that they came to him. And uh, there is a reason why people responded to people in a certain way. Sometimes, in another instance, 
a blind man, one guy, not two, one guy came to Jesus, and Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? It's kind of like, well, it's obvious, Jesus. The guy wants to be healed. Well, not necessarily. We don't know what the faith is in his heart. We don't know what he really what he really wants. And that's why, you know, typically if I were to pray for somebody, I'd say, what are we believing God for today? Or what, say something along these lines, because I, I want to hear what we're reaching out to God for. What can I get in agreement with here? Because the Bible says, where two of us on earth agree concerning anything we ask, it shall be done for us by our Father who is in heaven. But sometimes people just, you know, have got major needs in their lives. Say, oh, I just want to feel better. Well, Let's agree with that then. <laughs> All right. So in this instance, the two blind men, they followed Jesus, and they came to him, and he said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And the indication here is that they'd already called him Son of David, which is a term that was going to be applied to the Messiah, and say, Do you guys really believe that I'm the Messiah? Because I can do, as it were, messianic healings, open the eyes of the blind, heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Do you really believe, really believe that I'm, I'm this person and do you really believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. When we walk by faith, we need to be definite. Yes, no. Um, if they had said, I hope so, then there would have been a question mark over their healing. They certainly wouldn't have got healed on their own faith because when they say, I hope so, it means that there is no faith there just yet. They've got a hope for healing, and that's valid, but in the end, we need to add faith to our hope so that hope can become a reality in our lives. You know, spoke a few weeks ago extensively around that whole area that many people have a hope of faith, but they haven't developed their faith uh, a hope of healing, rather, but they haven't developed their faith to the extent that they're able to receive. So they said, yes, Lord. And he said, according to your faith, shall it be done unto you. And the Bible says that their eyes were opened. Now, who's, on whose faith did they get healed? Well, evidently on their own faith. Yes, Jesus had the power. Yes, he released the power, but it was their faith that caused a release of the power of God, and their eyes were opened. And Jesus clearly indicated to them, or clearly stated, excuse me, he clearly stated that it was their own faith with which they received their healing. And so that's why we teach a bit around faith quite a bit, because you know, it's a good thing to, do, to build our faith in days of peace. So when we get into the days of war, in the days of battle, in the day of attack, our faith is working. I just extensively, I meditate in the Word here and there. I confess the Word. When things are wonderful, I confess the Word. And when things are challenging, I confess the Word. I, I just try to have a faith confession, meditate on the Word. Is Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 tells us, meditate in the word day and night. Build your faith day and night. Um, and I've said this before, but it's made such an impact on me, and I've always remembered that. Uh, one of our trips to the U.S., we went into uh, uh, a camp meeting with Ken and ha Kenneth Hagen, um, 1986 or whatever it was, and Fred Price was teaching during the day sessions, and he taught on faith. And I still remember to this very day the message that he taught. And amongst other things, he used an example. He says, many people treat their faith like a spare tire. And then he asked the question, how many of you thought about your spare when you drove down here uh, this morning? No hands went up. Nobody thought about their spare tire. Why, you, when you've got four wheels, who needs a spare tire? <laughs> All right. But one of the, when one of them wheels goes down and you need the spare tire and you haven't maintained it, you haven't filled it with air, you haven't looked after it, then guess what? The spare is not going to work. And so we ought not to treat faith like our spare tire. Like, oh, you know, if I ever need it, you know, I'll pull it out. No, no, no. Bring it out every day and, and uh, build it every day. 
Confess the Word every day. Pray in the Spirit every day. Get close to Jesus every day. Everybody all right this morning? Praise God. I'm going to close very shortly. Once again, I uh, uh, would love to open up the front of the auditorium and pray for people, um, specific to the area of healing, uh, but for any other area. Um, I just want to look at uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 20 and verse 21, because it addresses a, a specific um, truth, a facet of the truth that we're discussing here today that I believe is most relevant uh, when we're talking about faith. It speaks about Abraham, that God had promised him that he was going to have a son. And um, of course, we already know that Abraham had already produced Ishmael, the son of the bondwoman, the son of the flesh. And God says, no, no, that's not the one. I will bless him, but I, I will give you and Sarah a son together. You will not have to use a surrogate mother to produce a child. We will, I will give you a son. And initially, when God promised that, Sarah laughed like, oh, this is ridiculous. You know, like uh, she, not so, she didn't exactly say that, but she laughed because by now she's 100 years old. And God says, you, you're going to have a child. And she kind of, in fact, she was 90 years old. She laughed. And uh, Abraham wasn't quite sure uh, at that point. So anyway, God changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham. Abraham indicates the meaning of prince, but Abraham means father of many nations. And so you get the picture here. You know, nowadays we choose names because they sound pretty, but back then they chose names because they had meanings to them. And names were words that had meaning in that society. So when Abraham went around and he met somebody new and fresh, he shook their hand and introduced himself and says, I'm Abraham, I'm the father of many nations. Oh, good to meet you. I'm the father of many nations. And like there's every other nations, he doesn't have a single child yet. All right? I'm the father of many nations. And it seems to me that uh, that scripture out of Hebrews that we read before, where it says, hold fast to the confession of your faith. Abraham had to hold fast to the confession of his faith because when God, God told him to introduce himself as the father of many nations, it's a faith confession that he held fast to. And he could have got embarrassed. He could have gone, oh gosh, let's just go back to Abram here because this is embarrassing. I'm in introducing myself as father of many nations and all I have is servants. I got no kids. But he didn't back down. And he kept on introducing himself as father of many nations. And he kept on and he kept on and he kept on until he got to the place where he was fully convinced. <laughs> and there's a real key here, friends. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 20. It says that Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. See, when God first promised, Abraham wasn't convinced. When God first promised, Sarah certainly was not convinced. Sarah laughed. It's like, Phew, this is funny. God wasn't trying to be funny. He says, I'm going to give you a son. And you're going to bring forth a child with Sarah. And she laughed. But he kept on. And in the end, God says, all right, Abraham, it's, Abraham, it's time to change your name. So when he changed his name, Abraham had a faith confession. I am the father of many nations. Good to meet you. I'm the father of many nations. Good to meet you. Who am I? I'm the father of many nations. And not only did he introduce himself, he walked around and he began to confess, I'm Abraham, I'm the father of many nations. You know, I've made it a habit over the years, I'm just confessing the word all day, every day. I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings. I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. Uh, and, and I just confess the word. Uh, and I don't look for any circumstances to support what I'm saying because I'm only saying what the word says. And what the word says, if I confess it, it'll build my faith and then I'm able to receive that which... The word promises, and that's exactly what's taking place in the life of Abraham. He got to the stage where he was fully convinced. And when he was fully convinced, he was in faith. And it's almost like, I can't, as it were, you know, this is just a thought. I'm not saying, thus says the Lord. But it got to the stage where 
Abraham calling himself father of many nations was a confession of hope. But when he had faith, the very last time when he says, I am Abraham, it released the power of God into his body. It released the power of God into Sarah's body. Both of them were healed and they were able to conceive their child. Keep on confessing the word. Find the scripture, the promises that which you need. And stand on that word and don't back down. And don't back off. And as I say, for certain things, it's just something that we do. Uh, we're not saying uh, that like, okay, well, I'm, you know, I got about you know, three or four or five diseases or something, and uh, I'll just want to get a little bit better, and then I'll, just, you know, and then I'll just leave off. No, no, no. Confess your healing. And do the same thing with prosperity. Don't back off. Just confess your prosperity. And once you get to the place where your needs are easily met, you help other people. And don't back down because God wants to bless you so you can be a blessing to other people. Blessed to be a blessing. Many Christians are only thinking about this far and only for themselves and maybe for their family, but look way beyond. God wants to release uh, greater levels of His power into our lives for not only to help us, but to also help other people. Build your faith because when your faith is built, you can bring other people to your well of the revelation and help other people get their breakthrough until they're able to dig their own well. So with that, uh, let me encourage you. Abraham became fully convinced. And when he was fully convinced, he received his son. And there is no shame in working our way towards becoming fully convinced. When we first hear the word, we believe it in principle, but we haven't got faith for it just now. So we declare it. We meditate in it. And once our confession of faith is exactly that, the power of God is released and we have that which we are declaring and that which we are believing God for. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your word is living, it's powerful. Thank you, Lord, that you're watching over your word to perform it. And Lord, the, Jesus taught us that the sower sows the word. And as the word is sown into our heart and we nurture it and we water it and we hear it again, and we hear it again, that it, it brings forth some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that all of us are on our faith journey. Help us to get to the next level. And help us, Lord, to lay a hold of these principles and to practice them, to be doers of the word and not hearers only. And Father, by faith, we declare that we heal by the stripes of Jesus. By faith, we declare that all of our needs are met according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. By faith, we declare that we are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. By faith, we declare that there is peace in our homes and prosperity in our bank accounts. By faith, we declare that breakthrough is happening in every single area of our lives. By faith, we declare that you're pouring out your spirit on our nation in these last days. By faith, we declare that we're in the middle of revival, that souls are saved everywhere. And Lord Jesus, that you're building the church and the gates of hell do not prevail against it. By faith, we declare that we have the victory in Christ Jesus. By faith, we declare that you're coming soon, Lord Jesus. Help us to be ready in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We're going to close the preaching right